Uh, I'm very excited about this because uh, we have learned a lot in the last nine months and it has been quite, quite a tumultuous time. But I'm hoping today we can, I'm going to try to get through as much as I can about some of our observations uh, about what's happened in nine months in terms of its impact, uh, virtual learning impact on mental health, executive functioning. And I hope we can cover some really effective recommendations based on our experience, which has been sort of a crash course in supporting parents, young adults, uh, and professional, professionals about how to navigate this sort of new world. Um, and I hope we give you... Um, some good interventions, some good hands-on tools and tips to help get through the next phase of this. And I hope it's a stimulating sort of dynamic discussion that ensues after this presentation. So I'm gonna to go to my next slide and just talk a little bit about executive functioning and define it quickly so that we can talk uh, in more depth about it and uh, how to support it through the challenges that we're, that we're facing right now. So, as you can see, uh, ex executive functioning is an umbrella term that really covers a lot of cognitive processes. There's a lot of ways to define it. So I've just sort of distilled out the ones I think are most relevant. And it might metaphorically be helpful to think of this as an orchestra. And these are sort of the most common sections of the orchestra we look at. Um, and when I meet young people and I'm trying to figure out how to support them, I, I try to conceptualize, well, what part of the orchestra do I need to help them work on? And let's just talk a little bit about what the virtual world is like right now. Uh, we're all, we're in it right now. We're, we're, we're meeting through Zoom. Um, so communication uh, has really been impacted. When we communicate, even when we're quiet, when we're with someone in person, we're when we're having a conversation, we're not just focusing on the words being said, we're aware of all the nonverbal cues, body language, tiny facial expressions, Somebody might inhale, inhale really quickly before they interrupt you. So we're always kind of reprocessing this holistic sense of who somebody is across from us, who this listener is, who our audience is, how we're interacting with people. We're so hardwired to be social animals and this video interface really impairs many of these vital reflexes and habits. School, being in a classroom, we are so conditioned to how we interact with the teacher, hey, I'm not going to go to office hours. I'm just going to meet this person right after class, or I'm going, to, I'm going to pick up on this student's cue. All those things are so natural, and they're so impacted right now. So we're sort of forced to focus on this limited framed view, this sort of two-dimensional view of the world. Um, and, and we have to pay attention to words. So throw in poor video quality or internet connection issues, that can really rob us of reading these critical facial expressions. So think about this multi-person Brady Bunch view that we're so familiar with. This is even more exhausting and basically makes us multitask to the point that we can hardly focus on any single person. Uh, I find that's my experience all day long. So it's like a kid trying to study some hard math uh, and clean the room at the same time, which just doesn't work as well. So we, we have learned a lot about how to sort of remediate these things. And I think that uh, we can give some very simple to use interventions. Uh, so for me right now, I'm not even able to see the viewers uh, and interpret how you're perceiving and reacting to what I'm saying. And, and I thrive on that as a, as a speaker, something I would normally pick up through my peripheral vision when I'm live. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I know there are a lot of therapists on this call. A lot of therapists are finding they like the phone better than, uh, you know, Zoom or Google Hangout or whatever they're using because you can actually focus more. You can actually uh, focus more on the content of the interaction. Or some therapists, their, their clients are telling them, I, I don't like to just see your face. I'm used to seeing you as a whole person. And they're like, oh, maybe I need to move back. So uh, we're, we're all learning data, how to accommodate the, the situation. Um, and sometimes I find that a lot of students we work with, just shutting off their camera and being able to focus on one sort of channel of sensory input even small steps like that can be really, really helpful uh, and reduce the strain and conserve mental energy. So I'm gonna go to my next slide. Uh, I wanna unpack executive functioning a little more into sort of just three really basic processes that are impacted by virtual learning and things that a lot of people don't really think about but are so critical, generally speaking, to the learning process and the problem solving process that has to, we're, we're constantly trying to figure out how to navigate this complex terrain. 
So working memory is our short-term memory. It's where we put information very briefly to put into our long-term memory. Sounds simple. If you don't take information and put it into the long-term filing cabinet, you can't retrieve it, you don't learn. So it is the most fundamental process of learning. There's a reason why phone numbers are seven digits. It's a good chunk. We've kind of realized that's what most people can take. So all of you listening, if you think about being nine years old or something, you're going to remember your, your telephone number. You've stored it long term. It's like a perfect chunk of information. Uh, working memory are like your hands. We can only hold and pay attention to a certain amount of information. So uh, once you get one little extra thing in there, we drop it. So if I'm trying to, if somebody tells me a number and I'm like, okay, 772-3643, I'm just trying to remember it. And then somebody asks me, hey, what's 15 plus three divided by six? I drop it all. So one little thing topples the apple cart. Uh, so the bottom line is that we must be able to focus on what is most important at a given moment and ignore other information. That is vital to working memory. We're going to talk a little bit about um, the impact of, of, of uh, mood and anxiety on working memory because it's really going to add to our, our very limited load. Mental flexibility, being flexible in the moment, being able to problem solve. Before I just got on this, I'm calling Scott. I'm like, Scott, I can't find the link. We are doing this all day long. Uh, we are uh, sort of wired also to just, we're just simultaneously reading lots of verbal and nonverbal cues, responding based on all the input around us. And this is sort of the, the job of our executive functioning is to regulate our emotions and our attention. Um, in other words, simply stated, uh, controlling what we're paying attention to. And also I'd say the third important aspect is uh, self-control, how to prioritize things, how to resist impulses, really thinking into the future. How do we delay gratification? How do we manage our frustration? Taking our turns in a meeting or taking turns in a class. Uh, even friendship requires so much turn taking and that recipro social reciprocity that is so vital to sustaining a friendship. So su successful people do things in spite of challenges. Um, and I think we're seeing a lot of people find really interesting ways to compensate. So the bottom line is we're asking our, whether it's a client or a student, I don't look at therapy and learning as any different. We're teaching people skills. They have to take in uh, what they're learning in therapy or a class, internalize it, store it, and be able to use it. Uh, it's called generalization. How do I take things I'm learning and use them in different spaces and places and people? If I can do that, if I go to the dorm and I'm doing all my DBT, which is so skill-driven, it is an educational process, I need to go use it to other places. Uh, so if you don't have adequate executive functioning skills, not only is it hard to learn, you can't generalize learning, which is, which is really the outcome of any learning process that we're looking for. Next slide. So specifically, you talk to anybody in education or in the mental health world, um, there, you know, the rates of depression and anxiety, uh, which were already an issue, are really, really skyrocketing in this long-term virtual experience that we're all having. Um, social anxiety, depression, uh, I'm just hearing this all over the place, especially with college students. So let's just look at anxiety and why it might uh, have a direct impact on our ability to learn and function. So research indicates a high baseline anxiety correlates with deficits in attention control. And let's just go back to working memory. Anxiety, all those intrusive thoughts, it rents space in your head, um, takes up some space in your hands, your working memory metaphor. And so the more anxious we are, the less we can hold, the less we can store, the less we can retrieve. And even if you look at uh, in the DSM, anxiety by definition, uh, general anxiety disorder, difficulty concentrating, it's one of the diagnostic criteria. So uh, the more anxiety, uh, the more difficulty switching between tasks, we are set shifting constantly. And in this medium, it gets even more peculiar and demanding and everything we do requires more intentionality. We have to be really focused on what we're doing. Uh, treatment's unclear, according to the research, do you focus on the anxiety or the attentional control? I don't know, but we're gonna go over some techniques that hopefully just generally help. But it, would, it makes sense why anxiety uh, really impacts learning and working memory. And so um, working on treating anxiety and being able to surf through those difficult moments and manage it uh, is more critical than ever, especially 
for high school kids or college kids who are really, really, uh, many of them, this is just their only way of learning right now. Next slide. So one of the highest utility ways to help people with working memory, and this is it. Like if I get hit by a bus and you don't see me again, don't mean to be morbid, I'm just saying, this is like, this is the crown jewel of, of, of strategies. So we've learned through many, many years of studying um, recall, this is based on the Ebbinghaus retention curve, uh, how people remember things. And uh, really, really successful, smart people just remember a lot, they know a lot. What we learned over time is that people, after they've learned something, so let's say you went to a class or even a, any sort of learning session, which I consider therapy, they, they only remember about 20% of what they learned uh, a day later. They remember about 70% at the door right after they learned it. And about 10 minutes later, they're at 80%. So you get this bump, and then everybody just drops precipitously to 20%. If you could quadruple that, go from 20 to 80% over time, weeks, months, years, um, simply stated, you you're become extremely smart. So the way to do this is to review information. Um, so if you're taking a class, uh, takes five minutes a day, it's high utility because it's simple, the research says it's simple, and it works. Uh, review your today's notes and yesterday's notes. If somebody walks into a session, I'm doing therapy, let's talk about what we talked about last session. Continuing to cycle through information, it takes five minutes a day to read, read your notes. To quadruple your storage is an incredibly high impact intervention. So whatever people are doing, if they're fumbling in a class, if they're fumbling in any sort of situation that they have to recall or remember, reviewing material, distributing it, every, you know, the, the research actually indicates 10, 24, seven. If I review information 10 minutes after I learned it, a day later and a week later, with very little effort, I've quadrupled it. It saves time, it saves energy, and people almost always, uh, it's almost axiomatic when people do this correctly, they say, wow, I actually feel better in class and I can recall information and I feel like I'm doing better in general. So such a simple thing to work on with students and clients. Next slide, please. I just wanna, you know, we, we've learned a lot again, uh, you, you know, virtual learning was becoming more popular even pre-COVID and uh, we're learning even more now. There is so much, think about all that has happened with media violence, with just constantly seeing death tolls projected on screens. All that. It's really, really intense. So, uh, you know, looking at a lot of, there, and there's a fair amount of research that, that is on this, it's been going on for a while. Media violence exposure is related to poor executive functioning. Uh, and one thing to note for those clinicians in the room that this relationship may be stronger for adolescents who have a history of aggressive disruptive behavior. Just file that. Those people predisposed to that kind of behavior may need to curb that appetite. Uh, it may be something that you sort of integrate into your treatment approach. Depressed people, especially, and we are seeing just rates of suicidal ideation. I mean, the social ideation, the social isolation, the fragmented peer relationships that are going on, even in, especially those like freshmen in college, that's like when you go and you're trying to figure things out, everything is so dramatically hindered right now. So people expressing any sort of ideation are characterized by a fair degree of cognitive rigidity. And the research has found a very strong correlation between those with poor executive functioning, which is you know our frontal lobe kind of issue, prefrontal cortex, um, and dif dysfunctional decision-making. And this may lead them more vulnerability to suicide. Um, and right now it's, it's even harder to track folks like this. So I guess, you know, the takeaway here is that if you're working with people that are starting to show ideation, um, you know, really track them closely. Um, and, and I find people that are very depressed, uh, one of the most important things is don't, don't make a decision, big decision now. Uh, that's, you know, we, we've already found that people with online learning, especially college students, have a much higher dropout rate from a class. They just tend not to engage as much as being in person where you can go talk to the teacher, you can get other supports. So suicidal ideation is something to even be more focused on in terms of um, that sort of cognitive, um, the rigidity that goes along with people who, who end up sort of getting, getting into more trouble, dropping out of things, and digging into a deeper hole. 
we're seeing so much what, what I talked to somebody about today who's a college guidance person said, all this crash and burn, people just getting themselves, they're not getting their work done, they're not, um, they're not catching up on work, they get into these holes and there's just so much crash and burn right now. Uh, and this, in terms of family, just looking at this systemically, we see this a little more in some of the younger kids I've worked with. Um, parental limit setting uh, appears to be, uh, we're working a lot with families more uh, these days, appears to be associated with development of executive functioning in children not diagnosed with ADHD, which was interesting. So again, working more systemically than ever. And one of the things Zoom has allowed a lot of clinicians to do is you work with kids, well, you actually see their life a little more. You see, you literally are in their house, in their world, uh, and you want to maybe work with their parents or whatever you can around them uh, to develop some limits because that seems to actually really support executive functioning. Kids with ADHD um, are so struggle so much more with that kind of traditional parent management work, um, and you might need to take a different approach, and, and it just takes longer to um, develop those sort of behavioral habits to manage people. So just some of the takeaways that I see that are important given the context of things right now. Next slide. So there are some simple things we know. Again, uh, just think about test anxiety, which a lot of people are taking assessments. They're like in their bedroom. They're, they're going to these, these situations that were already uh, very anxiety provoking. But just taking a quick page out of DBT, this is like out of Linehan's manual. Uh, the goal is, you know, if you're anxious and you get into your sort of primitive brain and you're not in your prefrontal cortex where you can, this is the control center where we can take in information, store it and process it. Just doing your basic pace deep breathing exercise uh, is absolutely amazing uh, in its ability. It can cause itself just changes in sympathetic and parasympathetic activity, just getting somebody honestly on a test to breathe for a few minutes like this uh, can can actually kind of get them back. You know, they sort of get hijacked in their uh, executive functioning and you can get them back to the front of their head where they can re-engage in the learning experience just by doing pace breathing, slow breathing. It's a simple exercise. You can teach it to somebody in two minutes. Um, so it's really effective in, in reducing in the moment emotional arousal. And DBT is, of course, replete with like incredible distress tolerance skills. Uh, you want to incorporate them. Uh, you know, I'm finding a lot of people really need to practice this stuff a lot throughout the day, but especially when they're, they're stuck in these sort of tough moments uh, in their online learning world uh, or any sort of online interaction. So this is one of the quick go-tos when I get a call and somebody's really panicking. Let's kind of just work on this simple, easy to use technique. Next slide. So let's just talk about why better executive functioning is important. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, there's, there's a real lack of empirical uh, investigation about how executive functioning uh, under different con conditions mitigates the effect of stress on health. But just stated simply, overall research does support that better executive functioning during acute stress, that's we're all in a lot of acute stress, is correlated with reduced health complaints. It seems to attenuate, attenuate health impact. And specifically, uh, if pe you can get people to reduce their perception of stress, which is you know, kind of like why cognitive behavioral kind of approaches are helpful, uh, it can be really, really helpful. So perception is the key. Again, uh, I'm talking more about your typical cognitive behavioral, DBT, CBT, ACT. Uh, Prolonged exposure to stress impairs both academic achievement and executive functioning. So again, helping people manage, you can't get rid of stress. It's, you know, teaching people to manage stress. Um, and I've always felt keeping people in school, especially now where we're seeing so many people dropping courses, tanking out of school, but it's an amazing protective factor. Being in school is really predictive of future, just healthy outcome, success, however you want to measure it. Um, keeping people in school alongside treatment, alongside whatever they're doing is I think a really important long-term protective factor. And of course, I think we're all worried about the long-term implications of this pandemic and people just not getting the, 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 the help they need, not um, learning as effectively, not, not having all these developmental opportunities that normally take place. Um, they've just been sort of truncated for a while. 
Next slide. So just going to the slide that says final thoughts and executive functioning, just a few takeaway thoughts that I think are simple, uh, but kind of profound in their importance. Uh, and this is sort of just what we have distilled, you know, when I went out and sort of talked to a lot of people, even pulled my old, own staff. So what, what, what to do? Um, people talking to their students, again, any age, um, that have asked them to share their thoughts on the experience of online learning, they've been amazed at the, uh, you know, the great ideas generated. Um, and, you know, research is very, very clear. This has been going on for a long time, indicates that reflection can support emotional control, self-regulation, and self-monitoring skills. Having people reflect, generate ideas, feel a sense of agency, just give the instructor or whoever is kind of helping them feedback super vital um, to manage and sort of navigate just the complexity of what's happening. We're seeing once we, you know, once we started really doing this in a more intentional way, like literally scheduling time to get feedback from people um, and work back and forth, we're finding, you know, it's just collaborative problem solving. It's been super helpful. Um, the what if plan, um, look, learning new material is hard, uh, even harder in the virtual world for most students. So talking to students about what they can do, what things start, you know, when things start to fall apart, kind of having a plan, pre-planning, uh, you know, what to do when you get upset and frustrated. You know, some people, it's like they make a sound, a movement, some sort of self-talk, some sort of ritual that they can easily employ. These sort of routines or rituals tend to reduce negative emotional responses. Uh, again, think about that anxiety in the working memory. Um, Anything you can do to reduce uh, the rent being, you know, you know, all this stuff just rents a lot of space in people's heads. So reducing those things that rent that space uh, allows us to focus and regulate. So those sort of those sort of um, conversations, when somebody's in the right mindset to do them, and really have that toolbox ready to go, super super helpful. The triple threat, which I, I can't get into all of it now, but the piece that I want everybody to take away is. Review material, review, review, review material. It's simple, it helps, even if you're having a slow processing, even if you're anxious, even if you're working memories impacted, or you're, or you're super depressed, which definitely slows down cognitive processes, um, previewing and reviewing material, reading, you know, just looking ahead, look at the spark notes, look at the, um, just look at a YouTube video, anything that gives you sort of the gist of something before you learn it, really helps with processing reviewing it gets you up at that quadrupling 80% point. Simple, simple techniques that really mitigate the impact of um, sort of the, let's just call it virtual stress. Um, and make virtual as close to real as possible. I've seen some people do this very brilliantly. Uh, again, we're, we're used to uh, the classroom. I've seen teachers set up their classrooms exactly like their real classroom, but their office at home. Um, if you put you know, let's say teachers that put homework in the same place or whatever ritual they have, do the same virtu virtually. Repetition is helpful, it's comforting. The virtual world does not have the dynamic support of the classroom, so you have to do your best to replicate them. The professors that are um, creating better informational materials about the course and doing better graphic presentations, it helps. Um, you know, your kid's not always gonna come and talk to you at the end of class. Be more intentional about office hours. All those things we're seeing um, have been really sort of, sort of playing a mitigating role in the current situation. And that is retrospectively kind of uh, my two cents for the last nine months or so. And I think at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah. Thank you so much, Dr. F. This has been really helpful. And I, I was actually just thinking to myself in the second part of this presentation, we're gonna do a little bit of what you're suggesting, which is to just really think a second time and review in some ways, some really concrete ways that we can support given all the, the, the foundation that you laid about the importance of executive functioning. So I really appreciate all of that information. So in thinking about how to help uh, young people in the in the in the semester coming, you know, we were we were having a discussion about, um, you know, how, what this presentation was going to be about, and we really did take a, a a trip down memory lane and think this has been nine months in the making that we are here, and for college students and and high school students and other students, 
two full semesters and maybe summer school down the road. So fortunately and unfortunately, but fortunately we've learned some things uh, about what works and what doesn't work. And hopefully our students are learning what works and what doesn't work for them. So it's really helpful to think about with young people, how do we prepare for the spring semester in a way that, that manages the expectations? Uh, we've got enough time and experience under our hands and uh, under our belt now that, that we can make choices, not based on what we think might happen or what our fantasy might be, but actually on what we have experienced thus far. So, you know, thinking about these last nine months, of course, we don't necessarily need a reminder about what we've been through, but actually it's, it's hard to remember. I, I was just saying with my staff yesterday about how I've, I've forgotten exactly how I felt in March and April and May uh, because th this has gone on for so long. But as you might remember, you know, that spring of 2020 was really tough for college students and high school students, all students actually from little ones up uh, because of the uh, kind of emergency response that we needed to take as, an, as a community to manage the rest of the school year. And that often left a bad taste or a negative experience about virtual learning for students because when you change from a pedagogy based of in-person instruction to a pedagogy based on online, literally overnight or maybe over spring break, if you remember a lot of teachers were like, this is spring break and I'm spending my spring break figuring out like, how do I do this in the midst of a pandemic when I don't even know if I'm gonna be safe and my family's gonna be safe. So anyway, all that being said, we, we had that emergency experience in, in the springtime. Then if you remember the summer, so many schools were really thinking about what is our plan to come back? What can we do? What is within our power to come back to in-person classes? How can we make that happen? And a lot of schools here in DC really did have a very clear plan to bring folks back onto campus. And just right at the last minute, right first week or second week of August, a lot of the, the in-person plans were reversed. So here we are now having conversations with students about, okay, what's school gonna look like in January? And, and we are headed into another semester where in some ways we have enough data to understand exactly how the semester is gonna go, but we still continue to have this desire, maybe fantasy, maybe hope or expectation that, that we can go back in person in, in the spring semester of course, the news of the vaccine that's happening right now is thinking, when will that impact my ability to go? So here we are again on another kind of roller coaster that we've been on the last few semesters. Wanted to just lay that out as a foundation to thinking about what do we do? How do we help people with managing these, these, this yo-yo that we're on? So <laughs> in one way, I just want to acknowledge that it's very exhausting. You know, I think about what you were saying, Dr. F, that, that in, this midst, in the midst of managing this crisis after crisis after crisis, it takes so much of that bandwidth. And if we can free up some of the bandwidth in our own, our own uh, supercomputer in our brain or <laughs> in our head or, um, you know, utilize executive function skills so that we can feel less pulled on a string by a yo-yo and more um, agency about what it is that we can actually do. So what, if, what we're seeing a lot is a lot of students and their families are really waiting for others to make decisions about what's gonna happen with school. And that might mean a, a university student pressing refresh on their email every day, hoping that they're gonna get the email about can they get housing on campus and what kind of classes are they gonna be able to take in the spring? or families talking to other families, their neighbors or folks in their community or, or really waiting for school officials to say, what, what, what is the plan? Which really is a cycle of anxiety and disappointment. And it feels like folks can't make their own choice. And so I really wanna encourage us in, those, in our positions of being helpers in this area to try and help people do what Dr. F was talking about, which is creating that what if plan. What, what if we made the decision based on the information that we have from public health officials, from history of this pandemic being the best predictor of how things are gonna go, 
from the real news that it is going to take some time to get the vaccine out to the general public. What if we made the decision ourselves without waiting for somebody else to make that decision? And that might increase somebody's ability to, to manage and, and create their own path as opposed to waiting for somebody outside of themselves to determine their path. That might mean that they choose to take classes virtually. It might mean that they choose to step away from school for the semester and focus on something else. Uh, but any choice will feel likely better than just waiting in the wings, hoping that something is gonna happen or something being changed at the last minute. In that conversation, I'm really encouraging students and their families to, to truly look at the situation as a whole. As I like the idea of zooming out uh, as anxiety creates our fixated fixation on a single piece of data or a single aspect of the story. We want people to zoom out, look at the whole picture, take into considerations lots of things, not only the data that they have from public health and from the, their best advisors, but also to really think about what the fuel is behind their decisions around their hopes and dreams and expectations. So what, what's really the motivator behind the decisions? Is it a, an effort to stay on a track of timeline around school achievement that might be arbitrary? You know, if you're a university student, does it matter if you get the 12 credits for next semester in the spring or in the fall? We know lots of people do really well in five or six year plans on colleges and, and that's okay. And that doesn't have to happen in just a four year cycle especially right now, because we all understand that this is a, a completely unprecedented experience of being a university student and a student in general. But also really thinking about what are the students skills and challenges. All of us have different strengths and different weaknesses and really thinking about we are not all one size fits all. We need to really understand what are our strengths, how do they line up with the options that we have in front of us and try and pick the best plan that fits for ourselves. And thinking about that, that, that alternative path, as opposed to looking at that any alternative path that somebody might choose as, as the lesser evil or, oh, okay, I suppose, I guess I'll go do this thing, or I have to do this because my first choice is not available. But would there be possible gains from this alternative path? What could you get out of the experience? And like Dr. Ruff was saying, what can you extrapolate from this experience to other environments in your life? What, what skills are you going to take with you into the workplace, into relationships, into your independent functioning, which will give meaning to this choice different than I'll settle for this plan B that I don't really wanna do. Because you might actually be surprised about how much you can get out of it, even though it wasn't maybe your first choice. And in thinking about that, there are lots of students who will choose to take classes virtually. And, and we wanted to make sure to, to leave you all with some concrete tips about how to take advantage or make the most or set yourself up for success in the virtual learning landscape. And these are some things that Dr. F alluded to, and we're gonna repeat them so that you can remember them after this time. And then you can revisit in the email tomorrow that Tracy sends out so you can, get this uh, information in your mind. But, but really that these are some really what seem simple, maybe seem obvious, but are really important components that people need to put in place to set themselves up for success in virtual learning. Thinking about how to approach the spring semester in a different way or maybe a more, a more uh, prepared way. So creating a dedicated workspace, uh, we've all learned this lesson as professionals that, you know, we don't always have a lot of options. I think about my colleagues in New York City and small spaces, not like New Yorkers have a ton of extra room, um, but that we are setting up our environment for some success. So even if you don't have the, the privilege or the luxury of a dedicated office, or maybe you're sharing your home with other students or other professionals and you need to communicate about who's doing what, when, and what room, but when you're in your dedicated space, making sure that you have your materials that you need close by, are there some things that you can get to set yourself up for some comfort in that area uh, to make it inviting? Does that mean putting a piece of art up or 
something that's colorful or some fidget tools that you can grab easily while you're in a class. And the next tip is to um, really, you know, make a, a realistic daily schedule, but also stick to it. Uh, that doesn't mean we have to be rigid about our schedules because we do know that sometimes when folks plan out their day and then something comes up unexpectedly, it can be very disturbing to folks. So we need to be able to stick to our schedule, set a goal, try and, and make a plan so that we can understand what the best work practices are and also impl implement some flexibility when things don't go as planned, like uh, your internet goes out in the middle of a class or your headphones don't work or something like that, which is something that I think we're all navigating on a daily basis. So thinking about what's the right balance of what to put on your schedule, how much is too much and too little, breaking down assignments into steps or smaller pieces and considering each course for a university student should be about two to three hours a week of studying per course. So mapping that out, if you're taking four courses, that should look like about eight or 10 hours of, of work overall outside of the classroom. This is so, so important on the virtual landscape to be an active learner. When people are sitting in front of their computers as we all are right now, it is just so easy to get distracted. And it's easy to think, oh, I'll just go watch the video later. Or if I miss something, it's okay. Cause it's just like watching TV show, a TV show or it feels too passive. The way to, to take what could be a temptation to be a passive learner into an active learner is to have some steps that you can take to keep yourself engaged. So that might look like utilizing questions or comments in the chat thread or writing down notes in real times so that you can go back to questions that you have during a Q&A session. Hint, we'll be doing that in a few minutes here, but that, you know, that really thinking about what are the things that you want to follow up with uh, in the midst and participating through that chat or through other ways uh, while the class is going on will help you stay engaged. And then finally, uh, minimizing distractions. Uh, we have been socialized prior to this year to think that when you're on an online setting that you don't necessarily have to be as engaged, but we've known over this last nine months, nine months that this is real life. This is our job right now. This is our class right now. It is not just a throwaway because it happens to be online. So putting the phone away or silencing your phone, turning off distractions, maybe using one of the apps that turns off some of the, the apps that you might be more tempted to to check in like social media or news apps. And, and also communicating with your peers in your home or family members and say, hey, I need to really concentrate for the next hour. I'm gonna be in this room. I'd appreciate it if you just, you know, respect that don't come into the room for the next hour so that I can really concentrate. Or is it okay if I have this space for the next hour so I can really buckle down with some work? would that work for you? And learning those communication skills is really key. And I think these are some of the, the benefits to what we've done over this last year that we're gonna take with us uh, in the years to come, even though we didn't actually ask for these lessons that we're learning. So on that note, I'm gonna say thank you and pass things over to John, who's gonna get us going with some question and answer. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Evan, for... Uh thought-provoking presentation and certainly a, a, a walk down memory lane. It's, it's still hard to believe. It's been nine months and yet, um, yeah, it feels like a lifetime ago. Um, I think we've, we've all been forced online in ways that, that we could have never imagined. Um, and thank you, Sarah, for reinforcing the sort of silver lining through some of this as well, that it provides accessibility as far as learning and treatment in ways that we never could have imagined. Um, so we wanted to take the next, you know, 10 or 10 or 15 minutes to move into a QA. and a um, Please feel free to use the chat box or uh, just unmute yourself and, uh, and speak up.
One of the things that I wanted to, um, to, to ask uh, Evan about in particular is, you know, we, we, you guys presented beautifully on sort of the in-person and virtual comparison. I feel like as it relates to learning now, we're moving in toward, into more of a hybrid model uh, where there's a lot of districts and schools bringing people out back in person for a week, virtual for a week, even splitting it up day by day. Um, as that relates to executive function and anxiety, what, what's your perspective on that, Evan? What, what are you seeing and hearing? That's a good question. And, you know, I'll give like, a, I guess, an analogy that I always, when I worked with kids, um, if you've ever worked with, uh, let's say, a, a, even a middle or high school kid whose um, parents are divorced, let's say, who, um, who has, let's say, really executive dysfunction, um, and they have to go, I have to, I have to study in this place, and then I have to go to this place, I have to remember my books, and I, oh, and things are like that in this house, and different distractions, so the more set shifting that occurs, the more impact on executive functioning, especially when people are vulnerable to it, anxiety, depression, maybe already have a learning issue or ADHD. So, uh, so John knows where I live in my town and my daughter just started high school. They are um, half in, half out. So she'll go in in the morning one day, the afternoon. And even for her who has, thank God, inherited her mother's uh, executive functioning capacity, um, it's the more set shifting, the harder. Now, Getting better at set shifting is a great thing in life, but for those already vulnerable to it, I have seen it get really, really difficult. And I think what we're seeing now after nine months, just looking to the spring, even especially even colleges, and part of this, I hate to say, is the hand of capitalism that people are like, wow, we got to get kids back. But I think people are realizing if we can do this safely, um, learning is a lot less impacted when we don't have all these in and out and in and out. Um, again, that's like another thing to put in your hands to drop. Uh, and so we want to reduce the, the number. The number of transitions also makes, if you work with anxious people, what do they want to know? They want to know what's happening next. The more transitions creates more unpredictability and uh, more stuff to take track, to keep track of. So it's, that's been a challenge, John. It's a really good point. Thank you for that, Evan. We have... Um... We have a couple of questions that just came in. I, uh, one from Katie, I'll read. I'm curious about how to respond to teachers who are requiring students, middle schoolers in particular, to have their cameras on their whole face, the entire class. It's stressful for some kids, and then it makes it harder for them to focus. And I think this could be a, a, a twofold question as well. I'll, I'll add in, um, how do we handle as a therapist, a, a, a client, who is unwilling to turn their camera on or maybe part participating in a virtual group um, that's, that's you know, triggering for them to be in front of a camera. So I'll turn it over to you both. Sarah, I'll let, I'll let, I answer the last one. You, I'll, I'll, I'll back clean up on this one. <laughs> Good, I'll, I'm curious to hear what you'll say, Evan, but I, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about this in the therapeutic space at the dorm. Uh, because we do have uh, some clients who log into group sessions like this, you know, and it, it's a little bit difficult to understand what's going on with them. But we, we, we want to acknowledge that this is not a black or white question, that it is, you know, I think what Katie was saying is about the word requirement. And whenever we get into requirement, then it becomes a blanket for everybody, which is helpful when managing a classroom or a group setting. It makes it a little bit easier when everybody has the same norms and expectations, but it can be really difficult for people who need some type of an accommodation for this. So uh, in particular, we found some of our clients who are trans or have body image problems um, or anxiety uh, are really troubled with the reflection of their face back to them in this setting. Um, if there are also distractions. We have one client who really can't stop looking at his own face when he's on a camera um, that then makes it impossible for him to hear what's happening with other clients. So we take it on a case-by-case -case basis to understand what's, happen what's happening for each client, trying to understand it from a more nuanced perspective and what is their clinical presentation. And then we troubleshoot with them. 
And we do some thinking about maybe it's a strategy of hiding your self view, uh, which I do a lot because if I don't, I get distracted about how does my hair look and what about this thing and that thing. So hiding self view is an easy thing to do on Zoom. It's not always the easiest thing to do on other platforms, but we explore that. Sometimes people choose to put a, a, a avatar or a, 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 a picture of them themselves up that they can create that expresses who they are, which can give them some space to be their, their own selves. And then we talk about maybe there are times when it's appropriate to turn off the camera and not participate in that way and other times when it's not. And really helping them be able to set shift like Evan was talking about and make the decision based on different environments um, and when it would be more important to be uh, on camera versus not. So is this a job interview or is this a therapy session with your individual therapist and understanding the different perspectives that way and making it a conversation. Um, but we want to recognize that it is certainly difficult for different types of presenting problems for folks to manage that type of reflection. We do re re recognize and respond appropriately and make it a, make it a, 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 a team effort as to troubleshoot and problem solve. Yeah, it's, you know, that's such, uh, and if anybody uh, gets, I admit it, it's like the, the Time Magazine of Therapy, Psychotherapy Networker. Maybe it's like the People Magazine of Therapy. <laughs> uh, they, the last episode, which I love. And you can get CU credits just by reading it, taking the quiz. Um, they actually talk a lot about um, sort of the impact of, um, you know, the camera on therapy. But you know, like, first of all, like I said before, um, having the camera on being, we are so in this little frame, it is an energy train. And we're finding with a lot of kids, sometimes what they need is just a little break from the virtual world. Um, we all have a sort of um, finite reserve of, of energy and certain people, it just goes faster on Zoom, so to speak. And they just need to take, turn off, you know, uh, put on their cam turn off their camera just to conserve some energy and to regenerate. They just need a break. So a lot of our kids, I run a therapeutic school. Let's say they had 18 hours a week of, of camera learning. We, some of them, we titrated down. Maybe they just needed 12 or 13. And maybe those hours, they would just have office hours with their teacher. They could work a little more asynchronously. So some of it was just managing energy because this is so draining, but it is a spotlight. And uh, the people I've seen who've done very poorly are people with any degree of social anxiety. Um, I mean, this is really, really, uh, you know, in a classroom, you can sort of get a little anonymity. You can get lost. You cannot get lost here. Conversely, one of the groups I've seen actually do better um, are, um, are kids on the spectrum. Um, this, this is actually, you know, being in a classroom and navigating the social terrain of a classroom is very hard. So it's been adaptive. And I think post, all of this stuff we're gonna find. Yeah, I like doing webinars. Uh, we get more people this way. Matter of fact, I like them in our space and I'll also broadcast in so I can get people from you know the West Coast in here. So I think some things will remain that are good from this. Um, but you know, the school refusal kids, um, this has been great for them um, again. So I think there's some good adapt, for everything maladaptive, we always find clinically there's like a good part to it too. Um, and then I agree with Sarah that um, we're getting better at the functionality. I bet, you know, once you talk to people about, we've always made it a clinical decision here. If a kid wants his camera off, they have to talk to the clinician. They process it, they problem. So all the things we talked about um, and we evaluated it. Obviously, there are lots of kids who are like, let me just shut this off and go back to, I find my kids doing that at home, I'll be honest. Um, but even like uh, the functionality of creating a virtual background, some people are ashamed of where they live. Mm -hmm. Um, or they just don't want you to see into their life. So there, there are some technical workarounds and I think we've all gotten a little bit creative about that kind of thing too. Thank you both for that. I, I think it also applies for, for us in the helping profession. Um, you know, our, our, our clients have very much seen into our lives in ways that they haven't before with a cat running across the screen or the color of our <laughs> wall that we choose or the books that we may read um, or our children jumping into a, uh, to a session. Um, I think we can all relay some funny stories. So that's not much related to that. 
A um, couple of other points. There was a question about uh, DBT and there being handbooks or, or textbooks. I would refer you back to, uh, to either your primary therapist or, or, or the coach taking you through the DBT skills in particular. That's really the beauty of uh, DBT is it, is it comes with a very defined skills manual um, that can be a very sort of instructive piece alongside of the, uh, the coaching. Um, one comment that uh, came in from David require, uh, regarding Katie's question was um, the fact that he is requiring students next semester to be upright and have their cameras on. Otherwise, I don't know if they are in the room or paying attention. David, do you wanna to speak to that any further? You may just need to unmute yourself. No? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, this semester I let my students keep their cameras off. Um, one or two had their cameras on, but I could tell they were lying down on their pillow. Um, maybe they had a migraine at the time, so I was trying to be accommodating. But then I called on a student and all I saw was her picture and no voice. And so after class, I texted her and found out that she had, she said she was in class, but she had had to go to the bathroom, which I allow students to do during class, of course. So that's logical. But I've been talking to some of my colleagues who have decided to just require students to have their cameras on so they know they're actually there. And I find in faculty meetings as well, I say, I'd say three quarters of the, of the people have their icons on or their photographs and they're probably doing work or maybe not even there. Uh, they're just, uh, they have the semblance of being there. <laughs> I'll, I'll just piggyback on that, David, because, you know, that that is part of being the active learner that, you know, we can give people feedback that actually, if they can tolerate being on camera, you know, without some kind of other co-occurring condition that we need to make an accommodation accommodation for, then they, they are going to be more likely to pay attention to the class, um, which is what I push myself to do, because I know as soon as I turn my camera off, I'm looking at my phone, I'm emailing, and then I'm not actually listening. So okay. I, um, I, I personally adhere to that, that rule myself. Um, what I will also say is that I've, I've had the privilege of teaching online for the last couple of years at Columbia University School of Social Work. And the pedagogy that I've learned from online teaching in that class or in that setting has been so helpful uh, in this moment, because what, we've learned is doing a lot of uh, in-class polls or even fun things like uh, give me a heart emoji if you agree or a thumbs down if you don't, kind of an interactive question and answer that people can utilize the tools on whatever platform they're using can help people stay on their toes and students start to get used to the idea, oh, it's not 45 minutes that I can just check out and come back for the quiz at the end or whatever it might be. It might be that the, the teacher or the professor at any point might ask me a question that I need to give a thumbs up or a thumbs down on, even if that's an emoji or some, some other kind of creative way that we can do it. So kind of keeping people engaged from the professor or faculty side of things, as much as the student taking responsibility is really important too. So, you know, David, there, there are some really good, so I spent many years in the classroom. And, um, and then I really became a consultant to basically teach teachers how to engage kids. That was really what got me excited. And what, a couple of real good things to remember. Um, yeah, kids shut off their camera, but just, just remember the virtual equivalent. So when I was in a classroom and I had, you know, the Yiddish word, the, my grandmother, I thought it was my name for a while. Spilkes means ants in your pants. A lot of kids have spilkes. So, uh, John, you didn't know that word, did you? is, um, you know, that was the kid that um, I knew needed the bathroom, bathroom break, or I needed to tap their shoulder to redirect them. Or I'm like, hey, you know what, uh, Johnny, why don't you hand out the, the quizzes so they needed to move around. They don't get that, they get, they're, they're here. So we need to kind of create that virtual equivalent with, even with older high school or college kids, um, it might be, um, hey, you know what, we're gonna, you know, it's an hour class, why don't we, it's five minutes, let's have a five minute stretch break, uh, just catch your breath break. Here, just do this independent work. People need 
we need to find a way to give them what they need in the virtual world. And one rule of thumb that's helpful developmentally is for however old you are, let's say you're 16, uh, you're teaching a bunch of 16 or 17 year olds, every 15 or 16 minutes, you need to have a set shift in class. So 15 minutes we're working on the, you know, I'm lecturing. The next 15 minutes, you're answering questions. The next 15 minutes, are we gonna go into a breakout room? So we need to keep, otherwise class time is not learning time, even, even non-virtual. We have to do the same thing intentionally virtually. We have to create some dynamism in the class so people pay attention and they learn and they internalize it. And we have to really be thoughtful about it. And it's really hard. And again, elicit feedback, how are we gonna do this? But sitting up in class like this is actually helpful for as long as you can do it. People do pay more attention when they're sitting up straight and leaning forward a little bit. That's why you know executives are always at their desk like this. It puts you in alpha state, which is like a relaxed state of learning. So yes, you, you want them there. To keep them there, you have to kind of work dynamically so that they wanna be there and that they can learn and um, engage in what's happening. Thank you both. David, thank you for that, uh, that, that comment. So we have one minute before we all need to run off to our four o'clock. So I just wanted to thank you all for joining us today. Dr. Flammenbaum, thank you for, uh, for joining Sarah Hart. Thank you both um, for this thought provoking conversation. I just wanted to let you know, we are gonna be back next Thursday at three o'clock with um, Bridge House, the uh, founder and CEO of Bridge House talking about apart, not alone community and uh, assessment during COVID-19. Um, with that, happy holidays to everyone celebrating this evening and we'll see you next week. Thank you, John. Thank you, Dorm, for inviting us. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Thanks, guys.